Hey daywalkers and fellow travelers of the night and mutants now, welcome to another episode of Seek at Night where we're going to talk about the newest X-Men cartoon, X-Men 97, but I'm also going to show off some cool books like this, the art and making of the animated series, the original series. We'll show off a little bit of this too while I'm talking about this new series because I don't want to use too many images from the new show. I'd rather you guys, you know, just hear a couple things I got to say about it and then go check it out. I'm going to try to not be super spoilery on it, but I just got to overall tell you that I love the new show. I think today, actually, the first, uh, the fifth episode just dropped today, and boy, was it gut wrenching. So we're going to talk about this. Might be a little bit of a longer video, but we're going to talk about the first five episodes, and we're going to show off some cool X Men stuff from the past uh, that I have that uh, kind of ties into this world a little bit. So starting with this, the art of making, uh, the art and making of the animated series. This is a really awesome book, and I would say if you, you know, I'll put links to everything that I show off uh, that is still for sale. I'll put it down below. But if you have not picked this up and you're an X-Men fan and you like the original cartoon, this is a must. And I will say, you know, they even talk about Pride of the X-Men in here and comic book influences and, you know, everything. They show off a lot of cool stuff. Character designs um, of these two, especially how, how serendipitous that I would land on that page. Um, but yeah, just awesome, awesome stuff. And then same with Jubilee and Jean. Like, everyone's getting really cool moments this season. And they're picking up pretty much right where the last series ended. And my exposure to last series, I'm sure I watched it as a kid, but I don't have memories of watching it as a kid due to the aneurysm and, and other things that we go through, obviously. But um, I came across it again when I was getting back into the world and I was in, in California and a friend of mine uh, that I worked for, Omar, he was like, hey, man, you, you talk about X-Men sometimes, you know, from working at Golden Apple, you picked up some cool X-Men books and it pulled you back into that world. You know, would you like to check out the animated series from the 90s? And he let me borrow all the DVDs. And I sat and watched them and I binged them. I was like, man, this is fun. Like, this is a really cool cartoon. And so I kind of became a fan in the last, like, 10 years of this animated series. Um, because, like I said, I probably was as a kid. But me, personally, not until about 10 years ago. And I really got caught up in it. And I would buy, you know, cool comics. And it's funny, one of the first comics I bought after watching the series, coincidentally, was Life, Death, Parts 1 and 2. Because I really gravitated to the character of Storm. And I also liked Forge, this guy who can essentially rebuild himself and, and build anything he sets his mind to. And I was making a book at the time called Alain Vital, which was about a robot, you know, human-type hybrid that was uh, learning to build, the, you know, itself through art. And I was like, wow, that's kind of like Forge. And so I really took to those characters and I really loved Life, Death. And then funny enough, this season on the new X-Men 97 show, they are actually uh, translating Life, Death into a two-part episode. So they have part one already came out and I think part two is next week's episode. So just really cool episode six. So I'm excited to see how that concludes because in the comics, it was really gut-wrenching. And Barry Windsor Smith did the artwork, and it was amazing artwork for sure. Um, but look at this. You get storyboards from the first season of the show. Um, this kind of touches on a little bit of the entire show, but it shows a lot of the work that went into the making of the first show and them wondering if they were even going to get a second season. And here we are, what, like 20, 30 years later? And these guys are all coming back, uh, 30 years actually, yeah, and they're all coming back to make a continuation of it which is just awesome. I think this is one of the best ideas that Marvel's had in a while is to bring this show back. But it's also the scariest because how do you live up to that memory? Uh, clearly, a lot of people who have memories of watching this as a kid, they really put this show on a, on a you know, hype pedestal, but it earned it. You know, it's one of those shows like Batman, the animated series, where it really earned it in Spider-Man and Gargoyles and stuff. It like it really is a great show on its own and it pulls a lot of influences from the comic books. So the first episode, it's neat that they actually touch on Sentinels and they talk about that being the big threat of the first episode because that's kind of the first two-part episode of this show back in season one was about Sentinels. So the first episode of this season has Sentinels in it, like I said, and it's really, really good because it has Jubilee in there. They introduce Sunspot and they have these awesome moments with Cyclops where he's using his powers in ways that most people haven't seen. If you watch X-Men Evolution, you've at least seen him land with his eyes before. Um, in X-Men Evolution, he didn't have the visor. He was like aged up and had full control over his powers. And him and Havoc jump out of a plane or fall out of a plane. And they land by using their powers to land like they do in this show, like Cyclops does. But it still looks cool because when he lands, he's got the superhero pose. So really cool. Um, you know, I don't want to get too much into the maker or creator of this new season. Um, I heard there's been a lot of controversy with that guy, and that's a shame. I was really nervous about him when I first heard him announce because he worked on 
Moon Knight, but he wrote one of the my least favorite episodes, actually my absolute least favorite episode of Moon Knight he was the writer of, and then he went to work on Blade, and that never picked up because of apparently script problems. And I was worried that, okay, this guy hasn't won me over, and then he comes to X-Men and he gets fired. And so that's all I'm going to say about that controversy because I don't know the details or anything. Um, but I will say, like, the team he put together to help write this, um, everyone did a great job, like, you know, for at least from a writing standpoint. Uh, it's really top-notch. I think this show is really great. So, you know, hopefully, you know, he wasn't some magic touch. You know, I didn't think he would be because, obviously, I didn't have a lot of faith in his past stuff. But again, I was trying to separate that. Sometimes writers can be bad on things and then shine on something else. And maybe this is the thing he shined on. Um, but I also saw, I think he even had someone draw him in as a cameo in the recent episode, in episode five. I think it was him at least. So maybe he's a little bit of a narcissist and <laughs> egotist. Um, but either way, like the, the team that came together to make the show from animation to the writing team and other things and producers and voice actors, like everyone has delivered. So I think the show will survive without this person in charge because I think now that people see, you know, or the people who are making the show see the reaction to it, they know what to build off of. You know, they know what people are liking and hopefully they'll just continue that into seasons two and three, which apparently this show has already been greenlit for. So that's awesome. And so another book that's out there, if you're into the old series from the 90s, is the X-Men animated series, The Adaptations. And this was a series of comics that came out in the 90s that had uh, that followed the seasons of the show, at least the first three or four seasons, and they adapt the episodes. So this is actual adaptations of, you know, the different episodes, like, you know, uh, the, the Night of the Sentinels, first issue, and they talk about that. You got a Watu, which there was a cameo of Watu the Watcher in episode five of X-Men 97, if you were paying attention, very subtle one. Um, but yeah, so this just adapts the cartoon. And that's what this show or this comic series did. So if you ever want to, you know, relive the show and see some slight different angles and, and probably some stuff that was cut from the show scripts that, were, you know, were animated or didn't get finished in time, I think some of that ended up in here too. So you get some extra scenes and extra dialogue with certain characters sometimes. And Andrew Wildman, this is kind of what introduced his art to a lot of people as well, was this series because he had like a 90s Jim Lee style. He kind of fit in that realm of those artists and and really made this book pop along with the other artists that were on this book. They did a great job translating the cartoon. And so, yeah, the first episode of the season, Sentinels, and you, you see the X-Men take them down and fight a master mold, and in the desert where Storm creates glass out of sand, and oh, it's so good. It's such a good episode. Um, but then in the second episode, they start building into the relationships of the characters. You know, you got like Cyclops and Jean, obviously, and what, what they're going through, Rogue and Gambit. Uh, Magneto has now joined the team, and it's really cool because they bring him into like a court situation where he has to pay or answer for his past crimes because Charles Xavier, now that he's off with Lalandra on another planet, they just declared him dead, even though he's not dead, or at least the X-Men aren't sure if he's dead because he, he left to be saved. Um, you know, they're, they have to declare him dead here on Earth. So his assets went to Magneto. And this was Charles' way, in case he ever died prematurely, to get Magneto to come to his side. So a little bit of a manipulative thing there, but it is having Eric really question his motives at times, and he's really trying to do better. So the, the, you know, the Friends of Humanity, or whatever they're called, the terrorist group that they are, they were in the first episode, and they were using Sentinel tech. And now in this episode, they've upgraded their gear, and one of the main guys at the uh, Friends of Humanity, he's now wearing the Executioner garb. Uh, Executioner from the comic book, who I think appeared in either in an annual or an X-Men Unlimited issue, something like that, uh, where he fought Colossus and stuff. Really interesting looking character, um, but they just kind of make him a goon in this one, like a, a souped up goon. And he has this gun that has one shot in it that will depower a mutant. This is new tech that they're using. And uh, and that's what happens in the issue or in the episode is they try to take out Magneto and depower him. But it doesn't go that way. It actually hits a different person who jumped in to save Magneto. And uh, and it kind of crushes that person's spirit and uh, you know as well as take away their powers. So really, really well done. Like the second episode I thought was really good. They brought 
you know, all these politics into it, which always kind of has been there with X-Men. Even with the X-Men movies, when they started off, it's, you know, begins with Jean Grey, you know, talking to Congress about mutants, you know, and trying to get people to accept them. And uh, and then you have like senators and stuff that don't agree with, you know, what mutants are and stuff and, and don't, you know, want that to be the next evolution of people and find them dangerous. So there's still those conversations happening, just like the old cartoon did and just like some of the live action movies did. And has always been there in the heart of the comics as well, where it's about people's fear, right? Or the fear of the unknown and distrust that people have in each other, um, whether it's towards mutants or, or just in general. So having those themes still be a part of the show and still, you know, it gets, I wouldn't say it gets preachy, um, it ha but it has moments where it hits the nail a little too much on the head where you're like, mm, okay, but you know, that's fine because it's still a cartoon at, at its core. And so it is although a love letter to us as older fans, but it is also something to hopefully pull in a newer generation. So there's a lot of balance, I'm sure, that comes with making a show like this and dealing with the X-Men in general. And I thought they did a fantastic job with episode two. Really, really well done. Um, and that ending with uh, the depowered person and the reveal of a of another Jean Grey, uh, all that was just like, you know, as a longtime X-Men fan, well, a long time in the sense of 10 years at least, but I've absorbed a lot working at a comic book store. I read a lot of X-Men stuff, including Extinction Agenda and Inferno, which the third episode kind of bases itself off of Inferno. Um, and then I love it. And they do the opening credits, just like the show. This reminded me of the end credits. This is the ending of the show where they do the profiles of the characters they do it in the new show, just kept it the same. They added Magneto um, and Bishop and stuff, but they kept it pretty much the same. And uh, and then also the intro, they redid the, you know, the opening theme song, but it still sounds very good. It pumps you up. And I'm sorry, when I watch a new episode of this X-Men 97 show, I do not hit skip intro. <laughs> I might skip the recap, but I do not skip the intro. No way. That song just jazzes me up, man. And I'm sure it is for people who have been watching this show and, and loved it for 30 years and I'm just a guy who's been loving it for 10 years so yeah I can imagine but I still when I hear the song I'm like dun 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 like I get so into it um and I you know do the whole thing I fist bump and I you know I'm like air guitar like the whole I, I it's embarrassing and I'm glad I told you about it um but yeah so if you're out there and you want to pick up this adaptation book it's really good, really good. I think it runs like 125 on average, but I'll put a link to it down below. You can get it at your local comic shop or online somewhere if you want. I highly recommend it. And before we get into episode three, I just want to do a final plug on that and say that it's really good, just like episode two of the series is. And, and episode three now is diving into Inferno. And Inferno comes from the comic books, not this comic book. This is Mutant Genesis 2.0. This is a redo of the first like six or seven issues of X-Men by Chris Claremont and Jim Lee. And this is a lot of the inspiration. This run, uh, Chris Claremont and Jim Lee from Uncanny X-Men leading up to this run, this is a lot of the inspiration for this cartoon. Um, from design standpoint to character, how people are written, like it's, it's, it is a big influence. And it's this iconic cover here, just really, really cool. And seeing this 2.0 version where they recolored it, you know, and they touched up some of the inks and stuff, and they made it look a little bit more modern, uh, it's it's really well done. I like the original version, obviously, and it still holds the test of time, but this one is great. And X-Men number one, for those who don't know, by Jim Lee and Chris Claremont, that it's collected in this trade paperback here, this hardcover. This is the number one selling comic of all time. Of all time. It sold the most copies of all time. It went to like seventh or eighth printing. Like that book just kept pumping along. And so a uh, big, you know, that's a, a great badge to wear, as Chris Claremont and Jim Lee, I'm sure, do, where they're still the guys who created the comic that outsold every other comic uh, just in pure volume and numbers uh, ever. Uh, so that's just amazing. I think it's like something like a, a million and a half or close to two million copies, maybe more. I can't remember, but it's 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 up there like and that's a lot for a comic book. Um, and that means a lot of people had exposure to this comic book and read this comic book. You know, at a time where DC was like killing Superman and doing that kind of stuff to get sales up, this book, all it had to do was just start a new number one with a top notch art, you know, top notch artist. And, uh, and it's so good. It's just, it's still outsold every other event and every other book and anything that had like a gimmick to it. It's still outsold all that just by being itself, just by being it. Um, and that's uh, that's cool. And this run was amazing. I think Jim stayed on the book for maybe like 12 or 13 issues um, for the most part. And he got to draw characters like Ghost Rider and, you know, he brought in Omega Red and just really cool run. And uh, and so because the comics are the influence in issue three or episode three of the series, the new one, X-Men 97, 
they touch on a book called Inferno because we saw at the end of the second issue or episode that there is a, a new Jean Grey showed up on the doorstep of the school and she fainted. And of course, everyone remembers in the old show, Jean Grey fainted, <laughs> you know, and uh, and there's even there's a lot of references like that in this show. Like uh, there's a time where Bishop is sitting there eating breakfast and, you know, and Bishop gets some cool moments in the first two episodes for sure. And I really love that character. He's my, probably my favorite X-Man is Bishop. And so when he's and he's got a mission, he comes back from the future to stop, you know, someone from betraying the X-Men and killing them. And he thinks it's Gambit. And then in the comics, he finds out later that it's actually Charles Xavier turning into Onslaught. So he's got a really cool journey. I always liked that character, Bishop. And uh, and so he has this moment where he's sitting at the table eating breakfast. And he says, like, well, you know, uh, a world where the X-Men are led by Magneto. He goes, I've never been to that timeline like that. and uh, Or something along those lines. And it made me laugh because there actually is an amazing comic book called Age of Apocalypse where Xavier's son, uh, Legion, goes back in time and tries to kill Magneto before Magneto can become Magneto. And then what happens is his dad, Charles Xavier, jumps out in front and Legion ends up killing him instead. And so now we have a world without Charles Xavier. So Magneto became the leader of the X-Men, trying so hard to honor what Xavier stood for. And that's kind of what this show does. So it's neat that Bishop is now in that because he was a big character in Age of Apocalypse where he was the only one who knew that the world he was in now without Xavier was wrong. You know, he was existing outside of time and he was trying to help fix it and, you know, get it back to where Xavier was in charge because Apocalypse ruled the world when Magneto was the leader and it was bad. Like, things got really bad. So Inferno is this cool story where Madeline Pryor, a, a woman who realizes she's a clone of Jean Grey, created by Mr. Sinister, um, and now having the baby of Cyclops. Um, so, you know, at one point, Jean Grey and she got switched out and captured by, you know, Mr. Sinister. And then you had this Madeline Pryor put in place with the memories of Jean, so she didn't know she wasn't Jean. So Cyclops, you know, mar you know, not marries her and yet in the comics, but they hook up and they have a baby. And now that baby is in the hands of Mr. Sinister. Um, because after it was delivered, which, you know, they went to a hospital and the person was like, I'm not delivering a mutant baby. And so Rogue had to, like, touch the doctor, get his knowledge, and deliver the baby herself. Uh, so... That was like a pretty interesting moment in the episode for sure. Um, but they delivered the baby. And now that Cyclops has the baby and with a Madeline, Jean shows up and he's like, what is this? And so Jean reveals that she's the real Jean Grey and that Madeline or the other Jean uh, is not. And so that sends kind of like the clone saga for Spider-Man. It sends Madeline into this spiral a little bit and she ends up back under the control of Mr. Sinister and brings her baby to him. And he infects the baby with a virus and he's trying to perfect the baby with the virus in it so he could, like, you know, manipulate the DNA and everything. Because that's what Mr. Sinister's always wanted from the cartoons to the, uh, you know, the animated series. Like, that's all he's ever wanted was to actually, you know, to get the DNA of the Grey bloodline and the Summer's bloodline and mix them together and make, like, the ultimate child. And turns out that is what he's doing. But he's trying to infect the baby with something and then cure it so that way it can, you know live with the virus in it or something like that he's trying to work on it something and he's it's very you know sinister obviously and so the x-men have to go and stop him but madeline is conjuring up demons and bringing their past back to them and all this stuff and that's kind of a little bit of what happened in inferno where she took over new york and all these demons were coming out and she became the goblin queen and stuff so really neat that they kind of touch on that a little bit in this and do like their own version of it and it leads to a big moment which is from the comics where you know, Gene and Cyclops have to give up their baby and in order to save him. And so him and Madeline make the decision to give the baby to Bishop. And now that his time thing has been fixed by Beast, he can go into the future and save the baby, hopefully with a, a cure that maybe exists in the future and doesn't in the past. So really, really awesome storytelling and the way they pull all these comic moments and reinterpret them in certain ways. Uh, it, it works really, really well in the show. So episode three, Killer episode, really awesome, and I think a very good interpretation from that storyline Inferno from the comic books. Another big thing from the new show is trading cards. You know, there was this great series of trading cards from the 90s that Jim Lee did all, all the artwork for and that they were, you know, using, reusing Jim Lee artwork from the comics. And the cool thing is, is Marvel put out this little book here called Uncanny X-Men The Trading Cards, The Complete Series, all cards illustrated by Jim Lee. And there's great promotional artwork like this that they use in the new show to promote it. Like they were like, hey, get your VHS copies out and get, you know, get your trading cards out, you know, and they made mock-up trading cards like this 
um, that come with this book. They did this to kind of promote the show, and I love that. It just shows that the marketing team and everyone behind this show really understands its audience and what pulled them into the original show and what is considered nostalgia for them, like good nostalgia. you know. And it's like, yeah, okay, you can say member berries and all this other stuff, but it's cool to go outside the show and reference the arcade machine, uh, which they do in this episode, episode four, where you have uh, Montendo and it's Jubilee and Sunspot getting sucked into a mojo world where they're essentially in that you know six-player arcade game, uh, which is so awesome. It's like a Streets of Rage style. And you know you have a Jubilee episode where her and Sunspot are starting to get to know each other, and they're starting to flirt and connect with each other. And to do that and tie it into the original show by making it Jubilee's 18th birthday, and then now she's you know getting pulled into an arcade machine, which was what she was doing in the first episode of the show, was playing at an arcade. And Magneto being like, no, that's beneath us. We're not going to celebrate your birthday. We're X-Men. we got to be vigilant. And she's like, I just want to go have some fun. And she ends up getting what she wants, but by being pulled into the mojo world. And I think it's really cool. And so, yeah, the, the marketing, everything on this show has been awesome. But to get this uh, little book here, Bob Budieski, who uh, actually created a lot of the Transformers, he worked at Marvel, but he came up with the names of like Optimus Prime and Megatron. Really cool backstory with that guy. He's awesome. Um, but to do that and then come to this book and get all the trading cards reprinted, with the stuff that's, you know, some notes on there, the backs of the cards. Like this little thing, I think it runs like 10 or 15 bucks. It's really cheap. But I got to say, it's awesome. If you're out there and you're like, hey, I don't have the money to buy this car trading card set, you know, on eBay. Because I'm sure unopened boxes go for hundreds of dollars, if not more. And then sometimes the sets go for $100, $200. So if you just want to reminisce and go through the, the artwork and just check it all out, you can buy this book here, this complete series and it comes, like I said, with some trading cards in the back that were made just for this re-release that uh, recreates the cover to X-Men number one by Jim Lee, the number one selling comic of all time. So yeah, so the fourth episode is split into two parts. And it has, like I said, Mojo and Sunspot and Jubilee in one storyline and a cool twist. I don't want to get into that, but you also see Spiral and some other characters in that one, which is really awesome. And, uh, and then in the second half, you get an interpretation of Life Death which is one of my favorite comics featuring this character here, Storm, about her now that she is going through her struggles. I don't want to spoil it, but she has a major struggle she's trying to overcome and Forge reaches out to help her. And when he reveals why, you're, I did not see that coming. He reveals like why he's so invested in getting and helping her through this crisis. And when you find out why, you're like, holy cow, I, I didn't know he would be involved in something like that. Um, but he's now trying to, um, you know, he was very involved in a very, very small way. Um, and he talks about it because I was depressed, I was broken, you know, all this stuff. And, uh, and he goes, and I'm trying to make amends now, starting with you. And then he falls in love with her, just like he did in the comic book. And so I'm excited. I don't want to spoil what happens in the comic because Life Death Part 2 is the next episode of the animated show. And they might pull a lot from that. So I don't want to get into that because I don't want to spoil what, you know, what might happen or what could happen. But uh, Life Death is really good. It's very emotional. It's a, it's a really good heartfelt story about two people who choose or are facing choice about whether they just become normal like in in the sense of like not being part of the x-men and go live a regular life like gene and you know or madeline and scott were talking about before with cyclops um and that, that does remind me there's a moment where cyclops says i'm not going to abandon my son and then like two seconds later he leaves the room and his son is sent to the future without him and i'm like that feels silly like i wish cyclops he stuck to his word and went back and was at least there when you know Nathan was handed over to Bishop, um, but that didn't happen, unfortunately. Uh, that so that was a one minus for Cyclops for me. Um, and he has a moment in episode five where he kind of lashes out, so we'll talk about that a little bit too. Um, Gambit, ah, uh, great, great character in <laughs> Colossus, great cameo he has in one of the episodes because Morph, who I haven't talked about yet, does a great job of turning into other characters like Lady Deathstrike and Colossus, you know, and uh, and Toad, I think, or Blob, yeah. Um, and he turns Archangel. He, it, he, that's where you get a lot of your cameos from sometimes with Morph. So I really like that. And him having to face his fears to deal with Mr. Sinister again and help Gene uh, in episode three was really, really good. So, uh, but yeah, four, pulling from Motendo, pulling from Life Death. Awesome, awesome stuff. And uh, and it made me think of, because they were promoting the show with the trading cards, it made me think of this book. So yeah, if you're out there and you want to pick up a great book that is uh, has some nostalgia in it uh, maybe for you, but also collects all this amazing art that, did inspire the show in a lot of ways, I would say pick this up, add this to your collection, like I said, for 
It says twenty four ninety nine, but I think online I haven't seen it for more than like fifteen bucks. So worth every penny though, even if you pay twenty five dollars for it, worth every penny. Pick it up and go watch X Men ninety seven. Episode four was fantastic. And lastly, let's talk about today's episode, episode five, Remember It, which is a heartbreaking title when you get to the end of the episode. I was spending most of the episode trying to figure out why the episode was called that. And then when I heard the character say it at the moment they say it at, it's heartbreaking, especially in the moment when it happens. It's it's heartbreaking. So we do lose an X-Man in this episode. I don't want to spoil who. And if you want to talk about it in the comments, I would say anyone watching this who hasn't seen the episode yet, avoid the comments uh, because I'm sure someone will mention it down there. But uh, man, heartbreaking episode. Really, really well done. They kind of talk about the, you know, Genosha now, thanks to Magneto, has been considered to be brought in by the UN and recognized as its own nation. And that's what's happening. So you have, you know, the Hellfire Club, you have uh, Moira McTaggart and Banshee. You have all these characters that are now um, presiding over Genosha and they want a ruler or a king or a president, basically. And they nominate Magneto and he nominates Rogue to be his, like, you know, vice president slash, uh, you know, queen, whatever. And, uh, and he ta- they talk about fashion, so they mention some of the current X-Men stuff in a way, where there's like the gala and stuff. They show that Magneto has like a taste for that, and he you know wants Magneto or wants mutants to have their own artwork, their own music, their own everything, and their own culture. And, uh, and it's neat. And so that's kind of like leads into a little bit of what's happening in the comics now, the Krakoa age, um, but while still staying in the original realm of like the, the, their ideologies and stuff. And so this episode was was cool in that regard. And of course, Gambit tags along with Rogue because he doesn't trust Magneto and he can tell that maybe there's something there. And in this episode, Rogue reveals that she actually does have a past with Magneto and she kind of friend zones Gambit in a way in order to explore the possibility of actually touching someone. And even though she doesn't really, you know, she's not super attracted to Magneto in that way. Um, you know, she was a young, naive girl when she met him. And that kind of pulled her in because she just like looked up to him. So, you know, maybe you could argue maybe there was a grooming element or or it could just be that she just idolized him and looked up to him and had a crush on him. And that that led to something physical at one point. But now she realizes that's not what she wants. And so that's kind of her journey through this episode is her realizing her feelings for Gambit. And even Gambit says it's not all about touch. You know, like I I don't love you because we, you know, because because I want to hold your hand or anything like that. He's like, I always you know, joke about that, but really I just, I, you as a person. And um, I thought that was interesting. And especially I know Gambit's past from the comics and there was Chris Claremont revealed at one point that Gambit was a Mr. Sinister clone that went rogue. And I always wondered if they were ever going to touch on that in the show. Cause that's explains his eyes. He has like Mr. Sinister eyes. So anyway, um, but speaking of comics and things that like tie into the show, I wanted to show off my Jim Lee sign. Number one, x-men here which no i did not get graded um i think when i got this sign it was at a comic-con so i didn't think to go take it to a grading booth or have someone observe it being signed but it just so it's just something personal for for me so i got this signed um pretty much right after i watched the animated series i think it was the very next comic-con maybe 2015 uh when i bumped into jim and and he got him to sign this uh he also signed my resident evil magazine number one because he did the cover of it um but yeah so the this episode is all about genosha and and that being recognized, but if you know the history of Genosha in the comics, you know that there was a, a massive attack on Genosha, and that's what this episode is also about. Um, so speaking of marketing and other things, Pizza Hut, we talked about that in the last episode. Pizza Hut did a cool comic series. If you went to Pizza Hut, you could buy a personal pan pizza. Every week there was a new VHS tape, and then there was a new comic book and a little kid's meal for like $2.99 that came with the pizza and a drink, like a collector's cup. And you got a comic book. And then, like I said, you got the chance of buying a cassette tape of some of the episodes from the show for like $9.99. So I actually have all four of these comic books. Once I found out this these existed, I was like, well, I have to have them. <laughs> I, I have to have them for my X-Men animated collection. And so I bought these probably like, I don't know, eight years ago, something like that. Um, found them online for, for a really good price. Someone sold me all four of them for a really good price. But yeah, they talk about Mirror Island. I mean, this kind of set in a way in the cartoon universe or at least deeply inspired by it but yeah i had to show them off in this episode because like i said and they were all poly bagged and stuff and there was other x-men toys that came out in future seasons where they had toys with them at pizza hut but this was the one where you got comic books and uh, and so a lot of people do remember this as well um and then i just happened to find a gambit number one sign to us from james asmus so i just want to include it because it's uh, part of my sign collection so i was like oh, okay I'll, I'll put it in there but it does lead us to this new comic book, X-Men 97, which does tie into this new show. 
And like I said, in episode five, we lose an X-Man. It's a big moment. They fight this amazing threat. Uh, there's a, a couple of cameos in it. I don't want to give away who the threat is or what it is. But when you watch the episode, it's it ties back to previous episodes. So it's not like completely out of thin air. But it's definitely parts of humanity not happy with mutants having all this progress. Especially all at once with Genosha being recognized by the UN. Like it's too much for very hateful people. And so... That's where this attack comes from. And we have Watu, the Watcher. He shows up very subtly in the background. There's this great shot where he's just kind of sitting there looking over his shoulder as, as if he's just now noticing this universe. Like, hey, what's happening over here? Even though he appeared in some of the comic books that take place in this universe. But he kind of looks over and sees uh, the Mirror you know, the mirror Island, but the Genosha attack happening and also sees the arrival of Cable. And Cable shows up to try to save his mother, Madeline, as explosions are going off and she looks at him and sees his eyes and she sees his brown eyes and realizes holy cow you made it you're alive this whole time because they've met cable before you know and she didn't know like she has Jean gray's memories and stuff so she didn't know she was like I, I i don't get it like how are you alive and and he's like i came back to save you and i came back to stop this and then he gets pulled back into the time stream and he fails as the attack is happening and you got you know magneto trying to protect the morlocks and leech and then you got you know, Gambit and Rogue really stepping up and fighting in a big way against this big threat. Um, and while that's happening, uh, because, it, you know, that's all happening in the moment, leading up to it, you had moments with Jean where she's like talking to Wolverine and she kind of slips and kisses him. And he's, he realized, look, you made a mistake. You know, you really love Scott. But then her and Scott get in an argument because Scott still might have feelings for Madeline because that's the mother of his child. And, and then he also regrets not being there for, you know, Cable when he got or Nathan when he got sent to the future. So they're dealing with a lot of stuff. It's very much a soap opera, but that's how X-Men kind of is sometimes and how comics are in general. They just naturally have that feel to them. And so uh, so the fact that they touch on that and bring it into the show and really make you care about these characters and understand like when Cyclops lashes out to a news reporter, you get why. You get the, the weight that on this, you know, it's on his shoulders. You get why it would make him snap or lose his cool because Trish Tilby, who's a character from the original cartoon, she's back as the news reporter and she's doing a like a, an in-depth analysis of the X-Men going through their house, talking to each member about what it's like to be a mutant and what their mission statement is to get humans and mutants to work together and stuff. And, and Cyclops just loses it. And he's like, you know, I had to give up my son, you know, and I have, I'm, I'm struggling with my, the woman I love, you know, and there's clones. And he's like, you guys don't know about any of this stuff. And he goes, you just take us for granted. We show up, we clean up your messes. We clean up, clean up some of ours sometimes too, but we, we show up and save you. And, and the thanks we get is that you still send things to kill us, you know, and it's, uh, it, he just loses it, you know, and it's a very human moment, I feel, for Cyclops, um, because it's like, yeah, okay, you shouldn't have done that, you should have maintained your cool and composure, but not everyone can, you know, like, everything bottles up at some point and, you know, comes out of you, and hopefully people don't judge you too harshly when that happens and give you a, a room for some forgiveness, and I think that's what Cyclops' path is, is self-forgiveness and hopefully, you know, some forgiveness from others, for kind of stepping back now as team leader and letting Magneto do his thing, I think Cyclops is going to have to stand back up after the way this episode ends because there may be more deaths. I don't think there is, but they kind of allude to they don't they can't find certain members' bodies and stuff, you know, X-Men member bodies that were there on Genosha and other mutant people. So we'll see where it goes from here because the next episode is Life Death Part 2. But there is a comic book out right now, X-Men 97. This is issue one. Issue two, I think, came out today. And these are at your local comic store. You can pick them up. This is officially a prequel that leads right up to the events of the first episode. So it kind of helps you build back the universe, build back, you know, step back into it, get a little bit more Bishop action in this too, since he didn't do too, too much after the first two episodes, other than just take us, uh, you know, cable to the future. So I'm curious to see what's going to happen with that too, because I imagine that this is the point since Uatu showed up, that this is the point they have to come back to to fix and that's what Cable was trying to do, but maybe he couldn't do it on his own. So maybe he'll need Bishop's help or something. So I'm excited because we got five episodes left of this show. And where this one ended, I am just gutted. I am heartbroken. I really love the character that we lose in this episode. And it's it was really tough to watch. But it was such an awesome moment at the same time. Talk about going out like a hero. Um, amazing moment. So I don't want to spoil it, you know, but some of you might in the comments. So, you know, we can talk down there, obviously. But let me know what you think. I, I think this episode's long enough. I just want to talk about everything X-Men from the stuff I have in the comics 
some other inspirations that inspired the show. You know, the cards, I mentioned those and stuff. And I'm glad we went down this trip of memory lane and we fully caught up on the show. And I got all this done in one episode. So I won't be doing this for the future, for the last half of the season. I might just do a straight up review of it and we might get into spoilers or we might not. Who knows? But for now, at least I would say go watch X-Men 97. And if you like what you see, Watch the original show. It's on Disney+. Plus. If you have Disney+, Plus, you can check it out as well. Obviously, you must have Disney+, Plus if you're watching the new show, possibly. <laughs> um, and I know there's some gray area there for some of you. Um, but then also, pick up some of the comics that inspired the show. Pick up some of the comics that didn't inspire the show. Find your own version of the X-Men that you love. And let me know what that is down below. And we'll keep talking down there. Thanks so much for watching the show. As always, like, share, subscribe, all that fun stuff. And I'll see you all in the future. Peace.